So, are there any questions? So how do you get feedback to which mode you are in when you're playing? Are you have to, do you have to look at the screen? Or? Yeah. yeah, especially when I want to start tracks, I have to know on which audio track I am and which track I'm starting. But mainly when I'm, when I'm playing around in mode 2, um, I don't have to look at my screen. So I can go into the crowd and just bounce around. And that's really nice. But when I want to mix, actually make a, decide which track I'm going to play, uh, I have to look at my screen. So that's a limitation still. You need an interface with a DS. Yeah, that would be, yeah, it is possible. <coughs> um, I always use the, 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 the LEDs. What is a DS? Oh, Nintendo. Yes. The Portable the game. Yeah. Uh, it's got Wi Fi 2, yeah. Wi Fi. Yeah. So you could use that as your little portable screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. It's, it's Wi Fi. I was in the sideways approach, but if you had a beer and a DJ set up, you could switch features depending on what you needed to set up. Yeah, I had one gig, I just had the screen projector. Oh, yeah. But then the, the limitation is that people start looking at the screen, and you're in the crowd, and nobody watches yeah. it. Watch, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I use uh, the LEDs yeah. a little bit, as you can see, but still, yeah, <laughs> it's just four LEDs, so well, I can really <laughs> navigate my... <laughs> well, you can probably use graphics as your, uh, as your thing, as your feedback, and then project that. Like yeah. have some sort of hidden language within the graphics. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then you become a VJ and a DJ with the same graphics. <laughs> <laughs> some secret thoughts like they use in the movie theaters to think we get with the next role needs to be on. You know that those yeah. dots move. <laughs> you can implement uh, Braille, um, sorry, Morse code on your, um, in your vibration. <laughs> <laughs> It's nice, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, do you do all, all nine sets with this, or is, is this something that's part of a set where you use other stuff as well? No, no, I just do the whole set with, uh, with the new mode and the nunchuck. Cool. Um, also be one hour. Because uh, when I perform, and it's nice, and then I just totally go nuts, and after one hour I'm totally exhausted. <laughs> I'm also looking for a way just because my hands get really sweaty that after half an hour I barely can hold the Wii remote anymore. Use a piece of rag. Yeah, yeah all of a sudden already I guess uh, and it also already works a little bit. It's sort of a comment for the for me, so. Could you tell us what you use all the channels for? A little bit more in detail. I mean, you didn't, I, I didn't catch what you do with the, with the nunchuck. Oh, sorry. Um, well, with the nunchuck, I just navigate <coughs> through, through my, uh, yes. through all the tracks. And that's all you stopping things, whipping it? Yeah. And, and the buttons with your... Uh, yeah, I just, then, I just press a button and make the movement, and then I decide, okay, this movement is going to stop a track, yeah. or trigger an effect, or start a track. So, well, first I had just, I trigger tracks with, with a button, but then when you not paying attention. You just randomly start a track. So you got buttons left? Uh, no, I, I need more buttons. Because all of this, this, I divided it into two modes just because I, it doesn't have enough buttons. Yeah. So, um, have, you, have you ever thought about implementing gestures? Yeah. <laughs> so just yeah, I have this really small gesture recognition, this rewind uh, gesture, with, which I did at the end from rewinding the track. But that's still, he's, he's looking at the acceleration, so it is a really complicated gesture recognition. <laughs> I'm also working on this scratching plugin, which is, uh, which I'm working on, which I will not demonstrate. <laughs> but uh, that also has some, uh, some more difficult gesture recognition, but I still want to work on that.
um, use that time to focus on developing that aspect of the te technology that we were interested in working with, we could have something that would give us the possibility to get on the floor immediately and start exploring things in a, in a physical space. Um, my background, as Ross said, I, I come from a performance background. You know, my initial training and experience is in live performance. Um, in more recent years, I build interactive interfaces that are generally worn on the body. Um, not always, but generally. What interested me about collaborating with Ross and Samaya in this space was the it, it gave me a, a three-week period during which I could intensely focus on full-body interaction, which is where my personal research area space is at the moment. And as Ross said, our company has a lot of music and composition and to sound up. And for the last few years, I've been looking at wearable experiences and I'm really interested in immersive spaces as well as uh, sound control and in live performance using sensor systems. So I've had a bit of a background with that in working with a trio called Public Sense Complex. So lots of people have talked about the different setups that they've used tonight. What we did was use our first week of the residency to look at some proximity sensor technology as well, which we're not going to show that. But uh, the Weezer are that whole off-the-shelf plug-and-play option, and we decided to go with um, Masayuki Akamatsu's, aka um, We Remote Max Object. And so what we do is get the data from the Weez, and we had six running at once. We've found you know, some die at some point, and it might which, have which is not related to the software. It's actually related to the Weez themselves. Yeah. They, they can die. So, you know, and, and we're not throwing them around, but we're throwing ourselves around a little bit. So, getting the data posted by Bluetooth into a Max patch, which I've built, and then using the same RFP object to send the data over to Ross using the audio launch. Yeah, so we, we have this basic data stream of the acceleration data from all the Wii's that we're using, and I should say um, we are only using the acceleration data. Um, not with none of the buttons or any of the other sensing components. And this gets transformed by kind of my version of Junction, which is a Lua scripting extension to my audio mob software, where I can write scripts which um, perform similar functions and filterings to what um, we saw initially demonstrated by Frank earlier. Um, and then these sort of scripted transformations control sound parameters. And I'll I'll sort of describe a little bit more detail about those mappings a bit later, but that's the sort of basic system that we're running. I think Danielle's going to talk about how I'll, we proceed. I'll talk about the, the methodology we used. Um, before I do, though, I think it's important to mention that we weren't trying to create performance. Um, though this is a very performance-like context, and when we show you stuff, it will be very performance-like. It wasn't actually our aim. We wanted to pair everything back. And <coughs> the technology was, was paired back. We didn't, at this point in our process, want to explore what we really needed. We just wanted something that would enable exploration. And we did the same with the, the physical exploration and with the sound exploration. So I think that will be touched upon um, later as well. For, and, and I hope it will become clear just in, in what we demonstrate. With regard to our, our methodology during the period, we, we did a couple of things. We haven't worked together before, neither of us in, in any configuration, so it was the first time we'd, we'd come together, though we were each somewhat familiar with each other's work. So the first thing we did was do a series of kind of movement explorations without sound to try to begin to understand what our individual understanding and vocabulary and desires and, and interests were in this area. Then we started to do some, the same thing with sound, but without movement. We used FreeSounds, which is a, um, a Creative Commons licensed database available on the web. And we basically just individually found a whole lot of sounds that in a way could express for each of us what we were interested in to try to, you know, in build upon what we'd started doing with the movement, but in this other language, this sonic language. Then we moved onto the floor and we started um, trying to, to physicalize what kind of physical gestures could create these sounds that we'd found. And we used the, 
the sounds that we'd found on the web and just to begin to explore this space. How do we think the body can move to make this sound? Then we wanted to think about if the body moves in different ways, what kind of sounds does it make? And we started doing what we've called vocal um, prototyping. So rather than thinking, okay, this is the sound I want it to make, now I'm going to go away and find it and record it or create it or you know, work with technology to, to make the sound I wanted, we just did it with our voices. And so we did a couple of things with that. For example, one of us would make a whole lot of sounds and another person would try to move like those sounds. Or one of us would move in different ways and someone would try to make sounds that matched it. Um, to try to open up the way we were thinking about it, because we also did it for ourselves, but we found when uh, more than one person was involved in this process, it, it, it really kind of challenged the, the, our personal assumptions within this kind of space. Then from there, from this kind of building material and search for a, a kind of common vocabulary within this, in this space that we we're exploring, uh, we moved more into thinking about you know, okay, if the we, for example, and we'll, we'll show you something right now, if the we, for example, is here and here, and if we think about what kind of qualities it might have. So, you know, Samaya suggested... Interest. Oh. So we've got a we here and a we here. Yeah, they're just attached with bandages because we found it was a quick and easy way to get them on, get them off, and, and very much bodies that are all different shapes and different parts. So one, one week is a continuous kind of sound, which won't be continuous because we need to breathe. But so you, you get the idea. And the other one is a, a more momentary mm. kind of sound in response to it. So this is probably one of the examples that we got to after a weekend of doing physical tryouts and prototyping. So we kind of thought, oh, what would happen if? And it went something like this. It's like, how can we go the next step and once we start working with technology, what can we put together really quickly to try to, um, you know, use that as inspiration, as source for something for the weaves, which some of will now demonstrate. one of them's dropped out, but um, well, these guys are sorting that out. <laughs> um, so, I guess that was one process that we followed, which was to imagine what does this movement sound like and um, invent something and then try and implement it. Another another sort of way of proceeding was more motivated by thinking about a kind of abstract concept of mappings, and one of them that I was interested in was just this idea of um, creating systems where the sound was responsive to the amount of energy that you put into the system. It's kind of an idea that's been floating around for a while now. And um, so in that previous example, what was happening was um, the, the acceleration data, which you know looks like this jagged line, depending on how fast you move, we, we apply a high pass filter to that. So that only allows the, the fast moving signals to be detected, then we threshold that, and when the threshold's above a certain amount, we let through some grains of sound. But um, 
another idea is instead of looking at a kind of filtered version of the signal where you're tracking fast movements, is to kind of average all the signals together and try and get a sense of the average motion that's in the system. So either a kind of amount of acceleration that's being forced into the system or, or to um, integrate that information. So I take acceleration and try and deduce what the speed of something is. So um, a lot of the mappings tonight are either based on uh, acceleration or on velocity, speed, and then one right at the end is based on tilt. So it's a two-axis tilt. So you'll see we have them on our bodies, and it's basically like a way of detecting the angle of the body like this. That's the last one. But um, most of them are based on this concept of energy. And the thing about a three-axis accelerometer is that you've actually got three axis, you know, something like this, and you can measure acceleration in each direction independently. But what it also means is you can sum them all together and work out the acceleration or the speed without caring what direction it is. And this makes it really easy to use because you don't have to worry about which way it's oriented. So a lot of the mappings that I've done are based on that, and that we'll see tonight are based on that. Um, so i just switch to the next one. observing with these is that they um, sometimes just lock up and I'm not exactly sure why that is. But possibly it's something to do with loose connections. direct mapping of uh, energy to sound and um, I'm sorry I don't have time to kind of structure a performance with these but we have a lot to get through so we'll just keep moving through them. Um, so that was uh, as I said a direct mapping and this one is kind of uh, I need number one. Thank you. This one is kind of the opposite. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, hopefully Danielle's ready to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually told him it was more interesting when it was so difficult. He got to the stage where his body was breaking down and he was almost ready to vomit or pass out. <laughs> that he had to physically get to that space to, for the sound to break down. Um, so he had made it a little bit easier for himself at one point. <laughs> um, what, what I have is a little bit different. I have a, a wimmer on each leg. And one of them does things and without me doing anything. And I, oh, it's not that one. Okay. If I'm, I need to find what kind, of, what kind of movement, what kind of physical relationship do I have to create with the Wii in order to stop the sound. Where yeah, my other leg, when I move it, makes sound. So you have this moving towards silence and moving towards sound kind of opposition happening. At the same time, I need my legs to stand up. Um, one, I haven't played with this a lot. Another thing that we found kind of interesting with this one is, is just actually observing the search and the struggle of the performance. So I'll just see if I can get this one to get them to working together into something. Um, And as Daniel said, one of them is kind of set, always running, so you're modulating, whether you're slowing it down or speeding it up, it's always running, whereas the other one only gets uh, turned on if you like the volume gets turned up when you move. Now, how are you guys going? Okay. So the next one is uh, basically follows the idea of a hyper instrument. This is a kind of concept that been around for a while as well. I think Todd Macover at MIT coined the phrase. And the idea of a hyper instrument is one where multiple performers are contributing to the performance of a single instrument. Um, that's, that's my reading of it anyway. Um, and in this case, um, well, you'll probably see the mechanics of it. I don't want to spoil the shot. Um, but basically, we wanted to explore this concept. We were interested in working with relationships between multiple performers. Um, and we didn't get very far because we've been working with these very exploratory um, mappings and exploring different details. But this is one attempt at a hyper instrument that we have. I want to test it.
<laughs> okay, so you will have noticed that with many of these mappings, um, we've been exploring kind of very direct energetic relationships to uh, immediate response to the signals and creating sounds that are pretty direct in their response. Um, I kind of, after a while, started to think about moving beyond that and in, into a more, um, more compositional sort of ideas where the mappings would actually impose some sort of musical structure on proceedings. Um, so this is an example of that. too much about how what we're moving looks like. We're just worrying about how, how we can make those sounds and find those relationships between the sound where there's space. And when you, when you get silent, you don't know where it's going to go, but you know it's going to go somewhere different. And just playing in a temporal space with that. Speaking about... Well, I guess that's temporality, but I, I guess what we're going to talk about now is um, future directions. Yeah, so I guess it's been really interesting to see some of the other presentations tonight, um, which capture many of the ideas we didn't have an opportunity to explore yet. And um, one of them is kind of recognising gestures or recognising poses and using this information to to impose some higher level compositional structuring on performances that incorporate these devices. So this could be things like making a gesture which switches the sounds that you're making, or one person acting as a kind of 
uh, control it for someone else so I could determine what sounds other people are playing by making different gestures. But basically using the fact that you can have different parameters be fulfilled in order to move to another another uh, space, another level, another phase within what you're able to generate mm -hmm. and, and control or how you're able to relate or interrelate with, yeah. with that sound. And imposing kind of temporal structure like by things like once you put a certain amount of energy into the performance, you might move to a new phase of the composition or something, things like that. Um, but I guess the biggest thing for me uh, that's come out of this work so far is that there's clearly, once you engage with the whole body in a sort of performance setting, and this really highlights it, that you, there's this kind of tension between a more staged theatrical performance, perhaps you could call it that, and more traditional musical style of performance where action is primarily read as being directed towards performing with an instrument. So for me, this kind of tension between those two has been the main kind of opening up of new questions that I see as being something to explore in the future. For, for my future work, as I touched upon at the beginning, I'm conducting research into how technology can be used to poeticize our existence, basically. And within the context of that, um, I've been exploring interfaces that physically extend, sculpturally extend the body into space. And this gave me an opportunity to begin to explore, and, and we plan on continuing to explore this idea of if you take away the visible and tangible interface, but the body still has these augmented capabilities, in this case to in, interact with sound, um, what happens? And for me, a, a future direction for this work is to also, in a way, take away the sound for the viewer or auditor. So the person wearing the interface, whatever it may be, is hearing the sound themselves, and their movements are, are motivated by what they are hearing and their relationship to it and their ability to generate and control that. But what happens when we put that person with their rather odd idiosyncratic movements that go beyond bopping away to, you, to your iPod or MP3 player? When you put them in public space, what happens to public space? And what is, what is our understanding of, of movement that goes outside the very limited norms that, that we normally inhabit? And that's somewhere where I'm very interested in taking, taking this work. And my work over the last few years has been in a similar area to Danielle's, I've been looking at individuals and outsiders within society and the way in which post-9-11 city spaces have become really alienating spaces and places that create a lot of anxiety. So I've got a few other projects like that that I've been working on and this very much you know, pushes me towards the direction of being able to take it into public space and so that it's not in a theatre or a performance venue or a gallery space, but it's just something that, you know, you don't, you're not aware you're an audience member until you see something that happens on the street and either you, you get that moment or you know your friends looking in the other direction and they don't. So with, there's one more, one more short sort of e experiment that we'd like to show you and this one's a little bit different in that the three of us will be rooted in space. We don't get to move our feet.
it's very satisfying to, to do it. It, it, it temporarily shifts quite, quite dramatically. Yeah, and I think that's probably all we wanted to say. Um, we'd be really interested in opening up, opening up for comments and, and questions and discussion. I mean, this is, we spent three weeks on this, you know, it's barely the tip of the iceberg. We consciously held our natural processes back, if you like. It, it would be very easy for me to make some movement work that could have sound put to it or to make some movement work that went with sound and, and the same goes for, for, for Ross and Samaya to, to create something, you know, and to come in with, with our bag of experience and, and the things that we fall back on, the things we know that can solve the problems that we're facing or, or answer the questions that we're struggling with, but we very consciously held back everything to try to begin to find a new language and I think we're all quite interested in where we might be heading and, and what other people might have to say or challenge us on or contribute to that. Thank you. Thank you.